be, when in fact, the word mind is really just a label for how this functioning thing is working. When it stops functioning, that there's no function anymore, so we don't have the mind anymore. You are making this mistake of reifying a label for a function and changing it into a, changing a concept into a thing. And that's the kind of mistake that a lot of religious people make when they talk about things like love or forgiveness or God. They, they, they take these words that represent concepts and then think that they're actually representing things in the universe when they are not. That's the mistake you were making. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll move on. Got a question for Mr. D'Souza? Or Mr. Barker? The question is directed to both of you if you want to answer it. Um, in order to have a debate, you need to be able to switch to the other side if you present it with enough evidence. So my question to you, both of you, is what would it take in terms of evidence or arguments to believe in the exact opposite of what you've been arguing for or debating the past? Hour? I'll answer that first very quickly. If the graves of Corvallis, Oregon were regularly opened and dead people crawled out of them and walked around and went back to their homes and their families and their jobs and said, I'm here, I was dead, but I'm back again, I would change my mind. <laughs> I, I promise you I would change my mind. I'm not opposed to the concept of life after death, but I need something more than hand-waving to get there. I need something that would be fascinating if there were life after death. I would embrace it. I would, if there's a God, I would love to know that. I would have a million questions to, to ask him. And, and the first thing I would say to him God, is, God, I forgive you. In any event, I don't know if you'd forgive me, but we're not, we atheists aren't closed-minded. We're not, we don't have this scientistic opposition, you know? Evidence, as one of the earlier questioners said, extraordinary evidence require, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So with something like the resurrection, we're going to need more than some documents that are contradictory, that show evidence of legendary embellishment over, the, over time. Uh, I don't rule out the possibility of the resurrection of Jesus, but I put it at a very low probability. All historical claims are probabilistic. Uh, Caesar, uh, Alexander the Great probably did exist. Uh, it would be nice if we could go back in time and get a videotape of it to raise our confidence in his existence, but uh, I, I think most historians would say we have enough artifacts of things that he did. So yeah, uh, there's all sorts of things that would change my mind. If Jesus were to materialize on the stage in front of me, like he did in the New Testament, that would change my mind. And I would say, Dinesh, you were right. Uh, there's plenty of things. Atheism is is exquisitely vulnerable to disconfirmation. All we need is one or two evidences, and I would change my mind. I would be glad to. If we're discussing life after death, we have to discuss the forms of life after death that people actually believe. So if Christians were to assert that when we die, we pop out of the grave, and we then immediately go to Bob's Big Boy for their three ninety nine special. <laughs> then Dan, in showing his willingness to change his mind, has revealed stunning open-mindedness <laughs> to a Christian possibility. But on the other hand, if we were discussing a real issue, for example, is there life on other planets? And if Dan were to go to a science convention where all kinds of efforts will be made to try to find out through radio waves, discovery of radio signals, Morse code, etc. And Dan would stand up and say, I'll believe in life after planet, on other planets, if I see guys with ten eyes standing in line at Starbucks. He would be seen as a complete ignorance. Why? Because he is so dogmatically close to the real issue at hand that he has to manufacture a preposterous situation that no one's even alleging. When the issue really is, if there, is, if there is life on other planets, what are the possible forms it could take? How would we, as possibly inferior forms of intellectual life, discover those forms of life? Any intelligent inquiry would begin by scrutinizing that kind of question. And then the really, your question is, are you open to those possibilities? So no open-mindedness is revealed by saying, oh, believe it when some Martian jumps out of a toilet and bites me on the rear end. That's not, that's not debate. Uh, that's showing a kind of amazing close-mindedness in the face of a perennial human issue. Now, to, turn to answer your question, hey, is there life after death? I can't be sure. I say in my book, we don't know. In fact, one reason we call ourselves believers is we're not knowers. We're believers. There's a difference between belief and knowledge. Now, I believe that there's a country called Papua New Guinea. I believe in authority, I've seen maps, but I wouldn't say I believe in my brother. 
because I know that I am. So there's a difference between belief and knowledge, and what I'm arguing for is not knowledge, but justified belief. Are we reasonable in believing it, given what we do know? Granted that the topic is extremely difficult, extremely inaccessible to experience, extremely hard to take, to, to have data on. I admit that. But so I said we've got to take the little data we have and try to reconstruct which case has more evidence to for. That's all I'm saying. My question for Dr. D'Souza is, do people who have near-death experiences ever see hell, and, and or do people more often see heaven than hell? That's a very good question, and uh, initially when uh, Moody, uh, Raymond Moody wrote his book, Life After Life, he reported cases that seemed almost entirely heavenly. Uh, and in fact, some people said, some Christians criticized him and said, hey, what's going on? And Moody said basically, well, look, I'm not talking about eternal life. We're just looking at, if you will, the, that edge uh, between life and death. Uh, but subsequently, there have been a number of studies, one in England and one by um, Maurice Rawlings in the United States. Uh, and it, it, I, I believe one of the studies is even called the Hell and Back. And it's, it is a, a report and a study of unpleasant, nightmarish uh, near-death experiences which, by the way, also have a transforming effect. Uh, these uh, experiences, in fact, didn't, uh, didn't come out at the beginning, and there's a reason for that. I mean, obviously, people are much more likely to report happy experiences. Someone doesn't really want to go to the office and say, I had a near-death experience, I found myself in hell. <laughs> so, but it appears now that there's a body of evidence that shows both pleasant and also extremely uh, uh, ghoulish near-death experiences. Can I say briefly that I do agree with that? There are some cases of Dracula scenes and, and unpleasant, so that is actually true. It's unsurprising under the hallucination hypothesis that some people would fear death and have those experiences as well. But something that's fascinating is that almost never in any of these near-death experiences do people report seeing what the Bible describes heaven is like. They don't, the Bible calls heaven a city. Very rarely does anyone report a city, except for that woman from Guam who was landing in Los Angeles to see her, her, her daughter. Usually it's pastoral scenes. Usually it's fields of poppies and corn, and usually it's like a river. In Japan, they tend to see rivers a lot more for some reason. So uh, if near-death experiences are a glimpse of, of the afterlife, it's nothing like the heaven described in the Bible. Thank you. Yes, I was a believer. Thank you for bringing her to God. Thank you. To what? Thank you for what? Bringing her to God. I didn't bring her to God. Thank you for bringing her. Now, she was you already know. a Christian before I even met her. She was already a believer. Now, can you read Greek or Arabic writing? Can, I can't hear your question. Okay. Can you read Greek or Arabic writing? Arabic? I can read Greek. I can't read Arabic. No, I can read Greek. Neither can I. This is why born, This is why people who are born blind can't report colors. They don't know what they are. They can feel things, so they can. Thank you. Do you have a question? That was it. Okay. Thank you. Well, my answer to that non-question, I guess, is that <laughs> the uh, the fact that people who are congenitally blind report a visual experience, which is most likely explained by the fact that they are hearing what's happening and reconstructing that in their own way uh, is evidence for hallucination because if there is a soul that's separate from the body then why would some people's actual soul that's going up to heaven not be able to see color unless it's dependent on a particular brain state those hallucinations are dependent on states of the brain and that is one small evidence that what's happening is hallucinatory rather than an actual, real separation from the physical body. That's all right. Right, but you're not, you're not confronting the real thrust of the evidence with blind people. The issue is not what they see in color or they see in black and white. The issue is that they report things that they have no possible way of seeing at all. If their mind is hallucinating and reconstructing, let's say, imaginary experiences, or experiences from other times and places,
How do you know that there are three orderlies in the room? How do you know that they're wearing, uh, uh, the doctor is wearing a tie? How do you know that a forceps is on the table? How do you, in other words, it's the specificity of the experiences described in these studies that requires explanation. And to simply say hallucination is missing the correspondence in between these descriptions and the actual stuff going on in the room. That's the issue that needs to be explained. No, those descriptions are not that specific. We're going to have a single study on the subject. I've read many of those reports. I've thank, read those reports. Thank you, guys. So we're going to have to move on. And they are not that specific. They are discrepant. They have. They report things that didn't happen. And well, they have time for one more question. So one last question. We have to close. So good. Okay. So uh, for Mr. D'Souza, uh, you spoke uh, in your rebuttal about. Uh, mind-body duality, and uh, you, uh, you also stated uh, your position on the soul as being um, a faculty or a moral faculty that tells right from wrong. Um, is, uh, I, I, my question is, does that relate to one's personality as they are in, in the world uh, because of the mind-body duality, and also is this dynamic? Uh, does the uh, state that you are carried over to heaven in, uh, does it change depending on when you are um, taken to the afterlife? For example, Mr. Barker would have been many years ago a preacher. Would his uh, soul or moral faculty have changed from then to now? Quite honestly, I don't think we just as if we were to posit, as scientists do, the existence of other universes. And if you were to ask them, well, what are the laws that obtain over there? Even Stephen Hawking, uh, given the amplitude of his knowledge, would have to say, I can't say. What I can say is what things are not like. <coughs> They're not bound by space and time. They're not, maybe E equals MC cubed in another universe. But you don't know, because it's not our universe. It's outside the orbit of our experience, okay? In, in Kant's term, it is in the noumenal realm, to put it somewhere differently. Here's the point I want to make. Here we are flawed human beings with a short lifespan and a, a narrow horizon of knowledge. Even, a, even a, a, a humble science acknowledges this. For example, in science there is a horizon boundary. Uh, the universe has been around for 13 and a half billion years. Our knowledge is limited to the, to the radius of, of information that light can have traveled in that time. The universe may be infinite. There may be all kinds of stuff going on more than 13 and a half billion light years away. We'll never know about that. It's outside our horizon. Okay? So, to dismiss it as non-existent, or to throw slogans out like extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, fails to grasp the reality of our situation that our knowledge is inherently very limited. Now, what can we look for? We can look for clues in the world we have and infer things about the world beyond. So let's look at, you mentioned the, the soul. Let's look at evolution. Here's evolution, and let's look for it in one moment. We start with simple cells. Well, we start actually with non-living uh, non matter. Simple, the universe of Freeman Dyson tells us was very simple at the beginning. And then clouds, gases, planets, and then simple forms of life becoming more complex forms of life. Let's call this the arrow of evolution. And at the end of it, what? Mind. Us. A new kind of being in the world that can turn around, unlike any other being, and understand evolution. 